in the supplemental practice or, or homework problems here for chapter 7, we'll start with 7.1, which says a yield to maturity for a semiannual coupon bond is computed by taking the semiannual rate and multiplying it by 2. Is the YTM for a semiannual bond an APR or an effective annual rate? And explain. Well, an APR is the rate per period multiplied by the number of periods per year. And since that is exactly what we do on a semiannual bond, we take the rate per period and simply double it, then the yield to maturity is an APR. It's a semiannual rate that's doubled for a semiannual bond. It doesn't reflect compounding during the year. 7.2 says a bond has an 8% coupon rate, semiannual coupons, $1,000 par value, and six years to maturity. Draw a timeline for this bond and label the periods. Well, first, let me get the coupon payment. Coupon payment is the coupon rate multiplied by the par value divided by the number of payments the bond makes per year, which for semiannual is two. So each coupon payment will be $40, half of the $80 paid out over the year. With six years, semiannual in would be 12 semiannual periods. So for our six year bond, I'm going to have 12 periods. Each one of these will be semiannual periods. So when it says to label the periods, I'm labeling these as, as semiannual. And that 12th semiannual period occurs six years from now. Each semiannual period, the bond makes a $40 coupon payment. Does that 12 times over the six years. And then at maturity, the bond pays out its $1,000 par value. Part B says price the bond above using a 10% yield to maturity. Everything is semi-annual for this bond. There are 12 semi-annual periods. I have to discount the cash flows on a semi-annual basis, so that's 4% per semi-annual period. The price or the present value is what I'm going to be computing. Each payment was $40. And that lump sum future value or the bonds par value that it pays at maturity is $1,000. I know when I compute this price, the calculator will put a minus sign in front of it telling me I have to pay that out in order to purchase the bond today. So let's not forget, second clear TVM. So to do this on the calculator, second, clear TVM, 12 in for the number of semiannual periods, 5% per semiannual period is a discount rate, 40 is our payment per semiannual period, 1,000 is our lump sum future value, compute the price, and 911.37 is the price we would pay to purchase that bond. Certainly it's a discount bond because we want to get a 10% return out of an 8% coupon bond, so we have to purchase the bond at a discount. 7.3 says explain when and why a bond might sell for a discount price. A bond will sell at a discount when the yield to maturity is greater than the bond's coupon rate. The discount being a price below par means that, an example here, this bond, 911.37 versus $1,000 par, that bond's price will move from 911 up to $1,000. That built-in capital gain there gives us additional return over and above the coupon rate. The coupon rate will not give us sufficient return when it is below the yield that investors require. And thus, the bond has to sell at a discount price when that is the case. The reverse causes a bond to sell for a premium price. If the coupons are relatively attractive, 
meaning that the coupon rate is above the bond's yield to maturity, then it's paying out coupons at a relatively attractive rate. And in that case, the bond's price will be above its par value. You might be willing to pay something like $1,100, for example, to buy a bond with a $1,000 par value because those high coupons make you willing to pay an extra $100 over and above the par value to buy the bond because it's paying coupons out at a relatively high rate. In problem 7-5, we are to price a zero coupon bond with a $1,000 face value and a 7% yield to maturity under different lengths of maturity. We're told to assume annual compounding even though the book does suggest to use semi-annual because most uh, bonds are semi-annual coupon bonds, the book suggests treating zero coupon bonds the same way and discounting on a semi-annual basis. In this case, everything is annual, so that simplifies things. For part A, six years, and we're going to discount at 7% per year with no coupon payments. So all we're discounting is that lump sum $1,000 par value paid at maturity. On parts B and C, the only thing I'm going to change is the maturity, 8 and then 10 years, and the discount rate remains 7% per year. So I'll use the calculator and calculate the present value. Each one is going to have a minus sign in front of it, just indicating we have to pay out that amount to purchase the bond. So let's clear the display. Second, clear TVM. In each case, we're going to use 1,000 future value, 7 IY, and no payment because it's a zero coupon bond. For part A, I'll discount for six years because it's six years from now until I receive my $1,000 value. And I get 666.34. If I then go change to eight years, I get a price of 582.01. And 10 years, I get a price of 508.35. So I've written the results down here. And you can see as the number of years grows, the value of my bond is smaller and smaller. One way to think about this is the only way you get return on a zero coupon bond is to buy the bond at a discount. So that built-in capital gain, paying 508 and getting 1,000 back at maturity, the built-in capital gain there is your entire return on the bond. If that capital gain has to give you your return over 10 years' time, the discount's got to be pretty steep. It's got to be priced fairly far below the $1,000 par value. If that discount only has to give you return for six years, the discount is not as deep. In this case, the price would be higher at 666. 7.6 is fill in the blank. Part A says the coupon payment for a bond equals the coupon rate multiplied by the bond's par or face value divided by the number of coupon payments per year. Part B, the coupon rate, is the percentage of the bond's par or face value paid out over the course of each year in the form of periodic interest payments. In other words, the coupon rate is for an entire year. Coupon payments might be made semi-annual, and often they are, but the coupon rate is quoted for the entire year. Part C, interest rate risk and reinvestment risk are opposing forces because they are related to changes in interest rates in the opposite direction. In other words, when interest rates go up, bond prices go down, 
that is interest rate risk. But when interest rates go down and I reinvest the coupons at a lower rate, that is reinvestment risk. So an interest rate risk, prices are inversely related to interest rate risk, or interest rate changes. Reinvestment risk, the coupons are reinvested at whatever rate the prevailing rate is, so that's going to move the same way as interest rates and be opposite to that for interest rate risk. In Part D, it says a bond with a 7% semiannual coupon rate made a coupon payment one month ago. Its quoted price is 103. So the clean price, since this is a percent of par, is 103% of the bond's par value of $1,000, $1,030. To get the dirty price, which is the clean price, plus accrued interest, I have to figure out how much interest to accrue over one month's time. So let me figure um, each coupon payment on a 7% semi-annual bond is going to be $35. That's every six months. So on a monthly basis, let me take my $35 coupon rate and I'll divide by six. Thus interest is accrued at a rate of $5.83 cents per month. The bond made a coupon payment one month ago, so I just have to add the one month's accrued interest onto the clean price, and I'll get 1035.83 as the dirty price of the bond. Problem 7-7 says a municipal or muni bond yields 6%. That would be equivalent to what taxable corporate bond yield of similar risk to the muni for the following investors. Our investors have different tax rates. That's how they differ. What we need to remember is that we're going to solve for what's called the pre-tax equivalent yield or the taxable corporate equivalent, but we'll refer to it as the pre-tax equivalent yield, PTEY. That's calculated by taking the muni yield and dividing by one minus the tax rate. Thus, that pre-tax equivalent, if we would then multiply by one minus the tax rate, would give us that tax-free municipal yield. So we're dealing with a 6% muni yield in both parts of this example. The first one, the investor, is in the 20% tax bracket. So our pre-tax equivalent yield will be calculated by taking our municipal bond yield of 6%, dividing by 1 minus our investor's 20% tax bracket. So whatever taxable corporate yield this investor would get, they would keep 80% of that. So this muni yield, giving them 6%, of which they would get to keep it all, is equivalent to that investor earning a 7.5% taxable yield, or a pre-tax equivalent yield. A muni yield of 6%, is equal to a taxable yield of 7.5% to an investor in the 20% tax bracket. Because out of the 7.5% yield, they would only get to keep 80% after taxes, and that would be the same as that 6% muni yield. So the 6% muni yield is the same as 7.5% taxable when an investor is in the 20% tax bracket. Now in part B, our investor is in the 30% marginal tax bracket. So I will take the same 6% muni yield and divide by 1 minus the 30% tax rate for the investor in Part B. So the 6% muni yield is equivalent to 8.57% taxable to an investor in the 30% tax bracket. The idea is this investor, if they could earn 8.57% from taxable corporate bonds and pay 30% in taxes, they would keep 70% of that 8.57% taxable yield, and that would give them 
the same after tax yield as the 6% muni. So as we can see, the investor in the higher 30% tax bracket sees that muni equating to a higher taxable corporate yield than our 20% investor. In other words, if you avoid more taxes, the muni is more valuable to you because it is tax-free. You're avoiding more taxes at the 30% rate, and it's equivalent to 8.57% taxable.